Universities are supposed to be bastions of learning, vigorous debate, and free speech. Unfortunately, that hasn't always been the case in recent years. There are reports, after all, of conservative academics self-censoring, fearing punishment or retaliation. Now, of course, progressives might respond that they're simply stopping so-called problematic speech, or stopping hate speech, or stopping discrimination. However, regardless of the merits of that argument, and those are very much up for debate, every so often we see an incident so extreme that it is absurd. Case in point is an incident involving Professor Andrew Timming of RMIT. Professor Timming alleges that RMIT unlawfully dismissed him, and he alleges RMIT bullied him following what looks to be a rather innocuous tweet. Now, RMIT surely denies this, and I've not seen a response from RMIT at this point. However, the facts look rather compelling, and they do look like RMIT might have been in the wrong. But of course, this remains to be seen when it goes through the Fair Work Commission. So let's have a look at the facts here and see what exactly has gone wrong. Now, Professor Timming states that he was threatened with disciplinary action and bullied due to a tweet. So what tweet, you might ask? Surely it must have been so egregious as to warrant disciplinary action, so terrible as to warrant sanction from a university. Well, let's have a look at that. So it all started with a tweet from Andrew Tate of all people. Just before Andrew Tate was criminally charged, he got into a spat with Greta Thunberg. Andrew Tate tweeted, Hello Greta Thunberg, I have 33 cars. My Bugatti has a W16 8 litre quad turbo. My two Ferrari 812 Competiciones have 6.5 litre V12s. This is just the start. Please provide your email address so I can send a complete list of my car collection and their respective enormous emissions, followed by a picture of him standing next to his Bugatti. Now this, I will remind you, is before Andrew Tate was criminally charged. Greta Thunberg then retorted, Yes, please do enlighten me. Email me at smalldickenergy at getalife.com. Now this back and forth got some media attention, and it was widely reported that Greta Thunberg had owned Andrew Tate. Professor Timming then chimes in, and he remarks, demeaning sexual jokes when directed from a woman to a man, smiling face, winking face. Demeaning sexual jokes when directed from a man to a woman, bomb emoji, skull and crossbones emoji. Now this facetious tweet is clearly getting a couple of things. First, getting the idea that demeaning sexual jokes are generally bad, but also at the possibility of a double standard. If a woman were to make a joke about a man, then it's okay. But if a man were to make a joke about a woman, then it isn't. He's pointing out those two concerns, at least that's my inference. Now apparently, this resulted in threats of disciplinary action. I don't have details on these, but I will note that a reasonable person could interpret his tweet as criticizing demeaning sexual jokes. This surely would uphold any workplace code of conduct. Surely, any workplace code of conduct would not want demeaning sexual jokes. Therefore, if he is criticizing demeaning sexual jokes, which it appears he is, then it would appear entirely consistent with any workplace code of conduct and with any form of free speech at any workplace. Now one might wonder whether he could have remarked this a little bit better, or maybe been a little bit clearer about his intention, but to my mind, a reasonable person would interpret it as such. Professor Timming might also imply that there's a double standard, that Thunberg's joke is deemed to be acceptable, but a similar joke about a woman's body parts would not be acceptable. My interpretation is that he believes neither joke is appropriate, and therefore both jokes should be called out as being demeaning and similarly castigated. However, not everyone seems to have seen it that way. Now, as I've indicated, Professor Timming then alleges he was facing disciplinary action and bullying as a result of that tweet, or at least in the immediate aftermath of the tweet. Now, I don't have any broader context to this, and RMAT might argue there was disciplinary action for other reasons. I haven't seen any such argument at this point. Nevertheless, Professor Timming alleges there was bullying. Now this of course is quite plausible. Some people might have erroneously interpreted this as Professor Timming lining up behind Andrew Tate, or criticizing Greta Thunberg per se, and therefore some of the progressives might have decided to pile on against Andrew Timming. I don't have any additional facts at the moment, other than the allegations of bullying and the allegations of disciplinary action. Now, following this, Professor Timming lodged a complaint in May 2023 in which he alleged the university violated its academic freedom policies and did so by engaging in that disciplinary action and that bullying following the tweet. The academic freedom policy states, in part, every member of staff and every student at the university enjoys freedom of speech, exercised on university land or in connection with the university subject only to the restraints imposed by A, law, or B, 
the reasonable and proportionate regulation of conduct necessary to enable the university to discharge its obligations in relation to 1. The university's teaching and research activities. 2. The university's duty to foster well-being of students and staff. 3. The university's legal duties, including its duties in relation to visitors to the university. Or 4. The right and freedom of others to express themselves and to hear and receive information and opinions. Now you can see throughout all of this, there is no prohibition on, for example, calling out demeaning sexual jokes. Indeed, one would wonder whether calling out such jokes would be entirely consistent with freedom of speech and the type of thing that academics should be doing in their opinion, because presumably they would actually be in alignment with the code of conduct for the university, and therefore you would expect it to actually be protected by freedom of speech. However, thereafter, Professor Timming alleges things got worse. He states that he was stood down as a professor and deputy dean a week after lodging that complaint, and he was prevented from communicating with his colleagues. He states he inquired about why he was being stood down, and he was told that it was due to ill health. He also states that one day before this, he had provided a letter from his doctor stating, quote, Professor Timming is fit to carry out his usual duties now and into the future. Now, I don't know any background to any health issues, if any actually existed. There must have been something that prompted this letter, but I don't have any details on that. Reportedly, RMIT's own doctor actually instructed RMIT to return him to the role of Deputy Dean just after this. He was nevertheless sacked as Deputy Dean, becoming a mere professor. This was effectively a demotion, and presumably came with a pay cut. Professor Timming also states that he was bullied, including through RMIT withholding its support for his security clearance with the Australian Defence Force, which presumably would get in the way of his research, although we don't have much details on that as well. Professor Timming took RMIT to the Fair Work Commission, alleging bullying. RMIT reportedly returned him to work on October 2023, rather than challenge the case in front of the Fair Work Commission. One can interpret this as RMIT assuming that they might actually lose the case, albeit not necessarily being a concession of any wrongdoing. RMIT then did return to work. However, he argues that RMIT sought to assign him teaching that was not agreed upon in his work plan. I don't have any specifics on this. However, Professor Timming then initiated a workload dispute under the enterprise bargain, i.e. he was allowed to dispute the workload and he disputed it according with that enterprise bargain that was legally enforceable. RMIT then allegedly fired him for not doing the work that he was himself disputing. That is, he'd lodged a dispute over the workload and then RMIT fired him for not doing that very workload that he was trying to dispute. Now, I don't have RMIT's side of the story here, and I don't know whether they have a rebuttal, and I assume that they will dispute these facts. And like I've indicated, it is important to reserve judgment until all of the facts are adduced. But based on the facts as presented, RMIT could very easily lose the case unless there's some other compelling side to the story. The ostensible reason for the dismissal was that Professor Timming refused to do the work that was assigned to him. However, if he merely disputed the work under the Enterprise Bargaining Agreement and he appealed that workload rather than just refusing, RMIT's case would fail at the first test. You can't fire someone for exercising their rights under the Enterprise Bargaining Agreement. It simply would not be valid. Therefore, if that's really what happened, then RMIT is going to have its work cut out for it, disputing his case. But even if he did refuse to do the work, he could still allege bullying. For example, if the teaching load were unreasonable in the circumstances, or disproportionate, or not consistent with the enterprise bargain, or clearly retaliatory in nature and different from other faculty, he could easily allege bullying. For example, if other faculty teach three subjects and he was assigned five, he could argue he was being trained differently and this could indicate bullying. Or if other faculty have all of their teaching in one part of the year and he is assigned teaching at various inconvenient times, he again could allege bullying if he were being treated differently. The operative part of this is him being treated differently from other faculty members. And if he can adduce evidence of that, then he could potentially make out a case of bullying. This is even more so given the pattern of conduct that he is alleging. And this could be bullying, even if the enterprise bargain allows for universities to assign up to five subjects in this case, because it would involve him being treated differently. The operative part of this is being treated differently from other faculty members, especially if it appears to be retaliatory for something else, such as retaliation for lodging a complaint with the Fair Work Commission, or retaliation for this tweet that would, to my mind, have been protected by the academic freedom rules, but also wouldn't even have needed the academic freedom rules because it was innocuous and would appear to be consistent with any code of conduct. 
Going back further, therefore, it's likely you could actually build a case for bullying given the pattern of conduct unless RMIT shows some evidence that disputes this. Now, this highlights a problem. Even if a university or a company cannot fire an individual for a tweet or for their opinion, they can make life miserable for that person, so miserable that they want to leave. This applies in all workplaces, but it is in fact especially damaging at universities, because there are typically only a few senior positions in each field at any one time. Universities also often recruit at specific intervals, rather than year-round. Therefore, if someone is dismissed out of cycle, then it could take a very long time for that person to actually find a job, because the job openings might not be forthcoming. Therefore, it is very unlikely the professor can move instantly from place A to place B, especially if they intend to maintain the level of seniority without taking a demotion. Now, given all of these facts put together, Professor Timming is alleging he was effectively dismissed following a tweet. He made this tweet that to my mind looks innocuous, and then there was disciplinary action as a result of this and bullying as a result of this. And this snowballed. It got to a stage where he was stood down and he lodged a complaint with the Fair Work Commission, and then he alleges there was further retaliation. Now, if those facts are actually made out at the case, and if RMAT cannot dispute those or have some counter-argument, RMAT looks like it might be in trouble. Now, to be clear, I have not seen a response from RMIT. They presumably do deny the allegations, and we must ensure due process plays out rather than prejudging the case, because there might be some other side to the story. But the situation does look concerning. And if you want to find out more, or if you want to sign a petition calling for his reinstatement, we can do that at the Free Speech Union. I'll link to that in the description below. You can also donate to his legal defense fund, and I assume this could become a rather long and expensive battle. But in any case, do let me know your thoughts about this whole situation in the comments below. But of course, do remember to be careful about prejudging the outcome of ongoing legal cases.